Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, once again, program number two this afternoon, and uh, for those of you in the uh, studio audience, we'll pick right up where we left off in Ezekiel 34, and for those of you joining us on television, again, for sake of new listeners that have just caught our program for the first time, we're just simply a simple Bible study. We don't try to get too theological, and uh, I guess my number one prerogative is to help people see what the book says doesn't matter what I think or say, doesn't matter what some denominational teacher says, but what does the Word of God say? And uh, so we are looking presently at the covenant promises, especially between God and Israel, and how everything is leading up to His second coming, when He will establish that glorious heaven on earth kingdom, and Israel will come to the fruition of all of these Old Testament promises. But in the meantime, there's going to be several <clears throat> hundred years transpire, even before his first coming. All right, so now we're picking up our text then, if you will, in Ezekiel chapter 34, where the promise is that Israel will one day have the land of promise, because after all, they're God's chosen people, and God is going to make sure that they get every square acre that he deems for them to have. All right, we were in chapter 34, and I'm going to jump down now to verse 24, honey. Chapter 34, verse 24, where God is speaking now to the nation, and he says, I, the Lord, will be their God. Now remember, this is all looking forward to the kingdom age. It hasn't happened yet. And my servant David, now mark that one down, because you see the next covenant we're going to be talking about is the Davidic covenant, a covenant that God made between himself and David. All right, so always be aware of this term David. It's intrinsic to prophecy. All right, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, and I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will make with them a covenant, there's that word again, <clears throat> of peace. And I will cause the evil beasts to see out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the wood. In other words, it's going to be a place of complete safety. No fear of anything that could harm them. <clears throat> Verse 26, <clears throat> And I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing. I will cause the shower to come down in his seizing, and there shall be showers of blessing all upon the promises made to the nation of Israel. All right, now let's jump across to chapter 36, and then in a little bit we'll come back to 35. But now let's jump over to chapter 36, where we continue this whole theme that after Israel has been dispersed into the nations of the world, God will supernaturally bring them back to their homeland against all odds. And if you've read anything at all to the years leading up to the nation of Israel becoming a nation in 1948, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. They were under constant opposition from Great Britain, who at that time was the ruling force in the world. And the Arab world was in constant opposition. And yet, in spite of all, in spite of it all, the Jews ended up and began clearing the land and make it ready for production. But now into Ezekiel 36, verse 1, God continues with these prophecies concerning Israel's coming into the land. Also thou, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. And remember, like I said in the last program, all the Old Testament mountains of Israel are in the present-day West Bank. They are under Arab control. But the day will come when they will once again be part of the homeland of Israel. <clears throat> Verse 2, Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy hath said against you, Aha, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Well, isn't that exactly what the world, Arab world is doing tonight? Hey, it's ours. And we're going to enjoy it. But you see, 
they had nothing to enjoy until Israel came and got it in production. And then they come in. The enemies of Israel are claiming right to the land. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, because they, Israel's enemies, have made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side that you might be a possession to the residue of the heathen or the Gentile world, and you are taken up in the lips of talkers and are in infamy of the people by the rest of the world. Now verse 4, Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills, to the rivers, the valleys, the desolate wastes, to the cities that are forsaken, which became a prey and derision, to the residue of the heathen or the Gentiles that are round about. Verse 5, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy I have spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumea, which was another portion of the Gentile Arab world, who have appointed my land unto their possession. Ring a bell. My, it's in front of us every day, these very things, see? And they will claim it as their own. All right, now then, verse 6, prophesy therefore concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains and the hills, the rivers and the valleys, thus saith the Lord God, because I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury, because you have borne the shame or the persecution and the oppression of the heathen or the Gentile world. Well, we won't take any more from verses. Now let's just come all the way down in this same chapter to verse 24. Because I like to pick out these verses that are so explicit and yet so simple. You don't have to be a theologian or a rocket scientist to figure out what this says. It's plain English. All right, verse 24. For God says, I will take you, the children of Israel, the chosen people, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries. What did Moses say back in Deuteronomy? When you've been scattered into every nation under heaven, you will return. Well, now this is how Ezekiel puts it, see? I will gather you out of all the countries, and I will bring you into not the Arabs' land. Whose land? Your land. It's always been theirs. And even though God sovereignly uprooted them, God never took away the deed promises to the nation of Israel, that it's their land. Even though he chastises the nation by uprooting them and scattering them, yet he never gave that land to anybody but to the children of Israel. All right, now then we can come on over into chapter 37 and the vision of the dry bones, and most of you know that one. I don't have to go through those verses. But always remember that the dry bones were merely a picture of Israel out in the dispersion amongst the nations. And Israel out of the land of blessing is just like a corpse. And so the picture was of these bones that were depicting the nation of Israel in dispersion. And they were very white because they'd been out there for centuries. But now you see, come down to verse 11, these bones have come together, they have come back to life, and here is the explanation of the, of the symbolism, or the vision. Verse 11, <clears throat> Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones that he saw in that valley vision, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Now I think most of you know there has been a theological teaching abroad for many, many years that the ten tribes of the northern kingdom were lost and there's only really two tribes left for the end time. Well now wait a minute. Do two tribes compose the whole house of Israel? No way. No way. 
So right here we have evidence that the ten tribes were never lost. They were always a part of Judah and Benjamin. And so the whole house of Israel has never disappeared from view. It is still an entity. And I maintain that even today, God knows what tribe every Jew is connected to. I don't care where he is or where he's been. God knows what tribe he's belonged to. All right, so here we have it, that the whole house of Israel is depicted in these bones. And now he says, verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, Israel, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Now just to show you how theologians can foul up and corrupt the scriptures, one guy was trying to tell me one time that this was just a picture of lost mankind and that the salvation of lost mankind was depicted here in these bones coming to life. Well, now, how ridiculous can you get? This is strictly a picture of Israel in dispersion brought back to the land of promise. All right, now we can come down to verse 15. God's going to show a further illustration that all the tribes of Israel are still intact. None of them have been lost. None of them have disappeared. And they're all ready for the return of Christ. All right, verse 15, the word of the Lord came in me saying, Moreover, son of man, take one stick and write upon it for Judah. Now just, just picture this in your mind. Here you got a piece of wood, and they were to write upon it for Judah, the southern kingdom, and for the children of Israel, his companions. In other words, you've heard me teach before <clears throat> that shortly after the kingdom was divided, there was a migration of all the ten tribes to the north down into Judah. And so here we have that depicted. Not only Judah and Benjamin, but representatives of all the other ten tribes are now with them in Judah. But God is also going to make sure we understand that he has not forgotten the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. All right, so he takes a second stick, verse 16. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph the stick of Ephraim, and that's all part of the ten tribes of the north, remember, and for all. Now, just to show you how the New Testament is in full accord, keep your hand in Ezekiel. We're going to come right back. Jump all the way up to Acts chapter 2. Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And when these big wheel theologians try to tell people that the nation of Israel has disappeared. The present-day Jews aren't Jews at all. They're something else. Well, I can't help but differ. Now, here, as late as probably around 30 A.D., shortly after Pentecost. In fact, this is the day of Pentecost. I'm sorry. So this would be at the same time as the crucifixion. Now, look how Peter looks at it. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and we'll be looking at this when we come to the Davidic covenant as well. But here he says, verse 36, Therefore, because of the prophecies concerning David and the nation of Israel back in the book of Psalms, therefore, Peter says, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Well, what house of Israel is he talking to? The Jews out in front of him. They, too, were all represented by the 12 tribes of Israel as late as Pentecost. And then is, uh, Paul comes back in his epistles and he refers to the house of Israel, not just Judah and Benjamin, but the whole 12, or if you want to include the half tribes, the 13 or 14 tribes in total. All right, back to Ezekiel again, if you will, then. And so these two sticks... One representing the southern kingdom, one representing the northern kingdom. Verse 17, the Lord says, join them one to another, words, end to end, and they shall become one. Well, now, what's the symbolism? 
it'll no longer be a divided nation. It's going to be a nation comprised of the whole. And that's the symbolism. This stick becomes one, even as they were before the kingdom divided. All right, verse 18, And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Then say unto them. Now here comes the explanation. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will, sometime in the future, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, that is one of the tribes of the northern kingdom, and the tribes of Israel, that's the northern kingdom, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, which was the southern kingdom. And I will make them one stick, and those twelve tribes shall be one, God says, in my hand. Now verse 21, here comes that repeated promise. My, if you don't get anything else out of these two programs, you'll get one thing straight, that after Israel has been scattered into the nations of the world, God's going to bring them back. And he's going to yet fulfill all the promises concerning his covenant people. All right, so now you come down to verse 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, that is, with the nation of Israel. It shall be an everlasting covenant. It's going to go right on into the new heavens and the new earth one day. And I will place them and multiply them and send my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Then verse 28, and the heathen, the non-Jewish world, then they will know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. Now, I can't get plainer than that. They are his chosen people. They are his covenant people. Even though they're guilty of rank unbelief, have been all the way up through history. I just go back and read some of the books of history, Kings and, and uh, the Chronicles and then the book of Isaiah, Israel's constant rebellion, and yet God never gave up on them. As he told, as we'll see in the Davidic Covenant, he told David, even though they commit iniquity, my mercy shall never depart from them. God will never let go of the nation of Israel. All right, so verse 28 again, the heathen and non-Jewish world shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary or his dwelling place shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Now we'll come to that when we get to the new covenant, but let's put that on hold for now. All right, now how are we going to deal with the Arab world and their hatred and their opposition to the nation of Israel? Well, it's all here in prophecy. Now I'll come across the page, at least in my Bible, to chapter 38 of Ezekiel. And here we have the war and the invasion, as most of you heard it, of Gog and Magog. But I'm just thinking that most people today do not understand what class or what group of people are really involved in this great invasion. All right, let's start. I think we got time. Right up at verse 1 in Ezekiel 38. Now remember, this battle is going to take place shortly after the tribulation begins. Now for years and years, I just felt isolated. I never would find anybody to agree with that. Everything I ever read, they'd put it back there with Armageddon or at the midpoint. But now, believe it or not, I'm getting to see more and more people agreeing that this is going to take place shortly after the tribulation begins. And there's going to be an invasion by people to the north of Israel, and God will destroy them on the mountains of Israel. All right, let's look who they are. Verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. Now, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that this is a reference to Moscow and Russia. They will be the ringleaders of all this, but look who their cohorts will be. Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back. In other words, God will providentially cause the military to do this. I think they're getting ready even today. Don't ever think for a minute that the Russian army or the Russian military power is defunct. 
they're as viable as ever. In fact, I was listening to one of my old tapes back in the book of Revelation, made in 91 or 92, and I made the same statement. You may think the Russian bear is dead, but don't you believe it. They are manufacturing just as many arms today as they ever have. Their espionage people are multiplying by tremendous numbers. They're not dead. They are getting ready for this final great invasion. All right, now I'll read on. Verse 4 again, I will turn thee back. In other words, I will providentially turn you, put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you forth. And all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor. Now, of course, that's the language of antiquity. And you just bring that up into present day, and you've got tanks and helicopters and whatever it takes to make an invasion. All right, now look who comes with the Russian leadership. Persia of Iran, Muslim, 99 and 9 tenths percent Muslim, all right? Ethiopia, down there in Africa, or if there was another one someplace else, it still doesn't make that much difference. Ethiopia, religiously, what are they? Muslim. Libya, Gaddafi's Libya, what are they? Muslim. All of North Africa is Muslim, remember? All of North Africa. And all of them with shield and helmet. Now you jump up to six. Gomer. Well, that's East Europe. And you know, I didn't realize until we had that Yugoslavian war that Albania and most of Yugoslavia are totally Muslim. I didn't know that. But that's Eastern Europe. And now on top of that, they're migrating westward. So by the time all this takes place, a good portion of Eastern Europe will be under the heavy hand of the Muslim religion. No doubt about it. All right, so here we have, all right, now verse 7. Be prepared, prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto me. And in verse 8, after many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land. What land? That is brought back from the sword and gathered out of many people and against the mountains of Israel. Well, goodness sakes, what's that's the vivid picture of Israel today? Israel was totally devastated by the Roman invasion in 70 AD. It was overrun by one empire after another for the next 1900 and some years. And then all of a sudden, since about the turn of the century, 1900, the Jews have been coming in and have been reinstituting the land, bringing in the irrigation, and the land, as we said earlier, is blooming like a rose. All right, so here is the picture of Israel as they now sit ripe for this latter-day invasion. All right, <clears throat> verse 9, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, and so on and so forth. All right, now then, for sake of time, I have to come all the way over, skip all the verses. You can read them when you get home this evening. And let's come down to verse 21. As these hordes of the Muslim world will come on an invasion on the mountains of Israel from the north, they'll probably come down through Lebanon and through the Bekaa Valley, and all of the present-day Syrian and Persian or Iran, Iraq, that whole Muslim part of the world, I think, will unite with a Russian leadership. But God's going to intervene supernaturally. Verse 21, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. Now, goodness sakes, what's going to happen? In their confusion, they'll be killing each other. Multitudes of them. And on top of that, verse 22, God will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands. In other words, their battalions and their divisions of troops and whatever. And the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain, hailstone, fire, and brimstone. And God says, Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, 
and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. So this is not the worldwide destruction of the tribulation. This is the singular destruction of the Muslim world as under Russian leadership they invade the mountains of Israel. All right, now then in the minute or two we have left, back up with me now to chapter 35 and we'll see God's reason for coming down on the Muslim world with such wrath. Now, the point I always want to make, can God save the Arab or the Muslim? Absolutely, absolutely. We can pray for their salvation. In fact, we've got a few ex-Muslims in our listening audience, and we love them. There's nothing that we have hatred toward them. It's just that we can't comprehend why they have such a hatred for God's chosen people. Well, here's the reason from Scripture. This isn't Les Feldick's idea. I can love the Arab world, but that doesn't change it. But here, look what God decrees. Ezekiel 35, I only got a minute. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir. Now, you remember, that was the home area of Esau and prophesy against it, and say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, or O tribe of Esau, I am against thee, I will stretch out my hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay your cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, not for salvation, but be by virtue of his wrath. Now here comes the reason, and you can see it in every day's newspaper. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword, suicide bombers, doesn't make any difference how they do it. They have just killed the Jew out of just simply wanting to get rid of that group of people that they have so much hatred for. And then God says that his wrath is going to fall upon the Muslim world. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.